Uh, this is my third case. It was an inoperable case, a 72-year-old woman with an FEV1 of 23% predicted. And it was probably a bicuspid aortic valve, not perfectly aware of that at the time that we started the procedure. Heavy calcium, bulky valve, and again, just my third case in, in, at the very beginning of the core valve trials. And, and we certainly clearly did not know enough not to do the case. It was a proctored case. We Small had one case too, thank God. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so we did a balloon valvuloplasty with a 20 millimeter balloon without um, difficulty, and, the t and then a 26 core valve was deployed, and then all the fun began. She became suddenly hypotensive. There was um, uh, quickly no cardiac movement noted. She had really poor access in her femoral arteries, too. It's surprising we can get the device up the legs. And uh, so now we're off to the races. So this is, um, so while one of my partners was working on femoral axis on the other side, and it was too small for CPS, we clearly would have ripped open the artery. A balloon pump was starting to be placed. And I put a JL35 diagnostic catheter into the coronary arteries after that initial angiogram. And lucky enough to find where the os of the uh, left main was. Um, it, I did try to put a guide in, but I couldn't get the guide to fit, probably because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I didn't know which guide to use at that time. I wasn't really sure what the heck to do. So I went back with the JL35 because I figured I can get that in. And uh, flow, flow was restored. Blood pressure wasn't the greatest, but flow was still restored. And so to get a guide in, I put a, um, once the artery was wired, I exchanged it over a balloon for a, um, I think a grand slam wire was what I was using, and then I was able to take a guide, do a guide exchange over the coronary catheter and put the guide in place. And this is, um, I think, uh, I still didn't know which guide to use at that time. And you can see here, it's probably not the ideal guide situation. It's coming from a little below. It's not bad, but it's still coming from a little below. And uh, the lesion was identified. Um, so finally, a 3-0 guide was placed over the grind slam. P a POBA was done to better restore flow, and then a 4-0 drug eluting stent was placed at high pressure. And again, at this point in time, I really didn't know if I should s try to snorkel part of the stent, put it, land it perfectly, land it on the other side of the, I didn't, <clears throat> so I just kind of did whatever I felt like and put a drug eluting stent, lined it up where I thought the os was. There was probably one strut hanging back into the core valve, I didn't know if I'd be interfering with the valve or the valve would interfere with it, and then used a five millimeter balloon at the end and um, post dilated it. And uh, scent wasn't perfect, but here's that post dilatation, that's the final result. And, and that one worked out okay. So after more experience, um, I can tell you the sequence of events over the four cases that I've had. Uh, when I got to the very last one that I did, now there's an aortogram and then there's a picture of a coronary artery. So I skipped all the other steps in between um, just because you're working so fast. But this is a 78 year old man with a mean gradient of 42, valve area 0.8, very poor walk time, terrible COPD, and he was still intermediate risk despite all that. You can see here some of his annular dimensions. He was. Uh, um, I was going to show you the coronary heights, which weren't uh, very impressive. Coronary heights were, I think, uh, 15. I had no indication that, this, uh, that these coronaries would occlude. The, uh, it was an uneventful deployment here where at 80% you could still see the coronary arteries filling. Looks like a good landing zone. Relatively high implant and then, of course, no movement. So now you can see the CPS cannula is in place. So this one had adequate circulation of the legs. We quickly put them on bypass while the other person was working to get the coronary arteries. No flow, no left ventricular uh, function, a total occlusion of the left main. Once in a while, it's hard to find out where the uh, origin of that left main is. This, uh, then a, this time I knew to put in a GL3, JL30 guide. And um, one thing that I've found is often you don't exactly know what's occluding these coronary arteries. It could be thrombus, I guess, but typically our ACTs are very high. It's usually leaflet tissue, and it's often hard to poke through there if the left main is flush occluded. And so um, this one required a confienza wire. Once that wire was down, um, it was exchanged for a Pilot 50, and it was down the um, 
placed into the OM vessel. Um, and flow was established, the vessel was stented, but the patient was still not doing so well. The blood pressure was still kind of hanging out there, not so good. And you know this patient has prior bypass, and you usually think of these patients, you get away with everything, because they have some circulation, there's a network of collaterals, you never really get into trouble in these patients, except for this guy. And he's still no good, even after opening this vessel. So I had to go back and look at the coronary angiogram again, and there's another OM that's I've just stented across. Now there's two stents across a high OM, and since he still wasn't doing well, I just figured I'd stay in there and play with that for a while, and so I wired that other OM. If that, now that's through two stents that that OS comes through. That was ballooned and stented again. Did perf he did great when you opened up that other OM, so you don't always exactly know what has to be fixed all the time, and thinking you get one vessel done is often not quite enough. And just so that you know I'm an equal opportunity occluder, um, this is an 83-year-old with an STS of 5.3, and it's an S3 valve. I don't only occlude with core valve, I can occlude with anything. Uh, so this is a 26 uh, S3, uncomplicated valve deployment, and then all my sadness starts right here. And uh, so I got everything on this one. Um, actually, actually, I take that back. The right was chronically yeah, occluded. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. That was, a that was a chronic, totally occluded right that looked like that before. Thanks, Adam. Um, no blood pressure, no cardiac movement. Put on, uh, on uh, CPS again. Difficult to wire. Finally got a JL35 guide and a Pilot 200, and a guide liner was placed. I, I, Samir just talked about the guide liner. I think that's great, that's especially. Clot, though, right? You think that's embolization? No, I think that one's clot. clot. I think that one's clot. But it's hard to tell then, you know, all my... Well, but you're above the cage. Yeah, my, all my previous experiences with valve and valve tissue, so I always suspect valve tissue, maybe I embolize it, maybe something else is going on, but I think this one was clot. So I thrombectomized it, got some improved... I think that is, a, that is a valve tissue. You see that little thing flickering right at the ostium? And that's what caused the thrombus. Yeah, so it's tissue. Tissue. Embolization leading to thrombosis. You see that little wall that is there in front of your... I, pr I, I have everything on this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so doddered it, thrombectomized it, balloon inflated it, nitro, you name it. And so finally I put a stent in it and we got normal flow with better um, uh, LV function. So just the lessons learned. Coronary artery occlusions are rare. They're difficult to predict. And so I, the only ones I ever have are the ones I haven't protected. Um, hemodynamic support ha often should be ne is necessary, but it has to be really quick. And I think that if you don't get the coronaries open by angioplasty, the patient isn't going to survive. I don't know of patients that you really have enough time to get to the. It has to be a special case that you can get open that chest and put bypass to it. Um, one thing is if you have a core valve and you occlude the coronaries, one of the quickest ways out is just to snare the valve, pull it up, or get a big balloon and pull it right up rather than messing with the coronary arteries, especially if you know you're going to struggle with bypass. And always remember to use stiff wires. Um, guide catheters are really uh, helpful. If they're not the geometric designs that come from the bottom with core valve, I think you have to use guide liners through there. You're going to get trapped on this, with the stent or taking the guide catheter out at the end. So um, uh, in those con instances, I clearly would use uh, guide extensions. Anyway, thanks. Good, thanks. Yeah. So since uh, you use, you know, I don't use as many core valves as you do, uh, I wanted to know that if you want to protect the coronaries for the, with the core valve or Evolute, and if you're behind the, you know, valve, uh, is it, uh, is it enough to just put a stent behind it, or wh how does it work? That uh, do you have enough cases or literature to write it up or something to say how do you protect it? Do it? Yeah, to snorkel it back. Yeah. I, you know, you mean just to put the stent behind it? You know, no, I'm just deployed. asking what is the bailout. So let's say yeah. you oh, have yeah, yeah. A so valve. if you're going to protect, everybody has a little bit slight different method of protecting. When I protect, I have a guide, a wire, and a guide liner. I don't put the stent down. I figure if I need the stent at the end, 
I'll put the stent in so I don't waste the stent. Now, some people say if you're going to protect, you may as well stent on the way out. I don't know if that's right or not. Regardless, they do that. I, I don't. I have, a, uh, I have a wire down. I have the guide liner in the coronary artery, and I try to intubate the os with the guide, thinking that that's going to block any passage of valve up into the os. And then I take you're everything. You're still behind the hole. Right? Yeah, you're behind it. Yeah. So how high would you recommend so, now that you take it? Well, then I would snorkel the stent just outside the os. Because typically, you're, out, you're behind it, um, but you're, you're above, behind above the valve, your, too. Your, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that you skirt, would get paravalvular skirt. blood flow and diastole. It's I don't think that's right, a problem. So you're saying, skirt. right. Yeah. But if you're saying you don't have to get above the commissures the of the no. taver leaflets. No. Only if, you're below, only if you're below the skirt. Yeah. Then you have to tap right up to the screw. Yeah, I think, I think it's a little confusing when uh, we use the word snorkel because I think people think that you have to stent All like up, up to the STJ or yeah. something like that. It's just pushing the leaflet out of the way, just same as with a sapien. Yeah. You're just pushing the native leaflet away from yeah. the ostium. Yeah. Uh, it's not like some big there's, snorkel. There's typically a lot of room behind the valve most of the time. I, I haven't had a case like that. You know, it, that's why I think some people take the, take the position that if you're going to protect, you may as well put the stent in and deploy it at the end, that they're that concerned. I, ha I haven't done that. I just put the wire guideliner. I haven't been burned on pulling the guideliner out, and now you have a real problem. But that can happen. I you, do like can this. You, do you do, so for sometimes for the sapien, what I do is I'm behind. Yeah. I leave the guideliner. Then I put a guide from the valve sheath, big sheath. Mm -hmm. cross back in from the valve oh. and then remove the other thing sure so I am certain that I'm not holding sure back okay. yeah. and I if I need an access I can and that stent is nicer because it's not behind it's like what you just did yeah that it will come back into the stent so that way the coronary guideline or everything is there we have an access big access in the groin anyhow so you can go and put a guide and wire that's if things are stable that's just, yeah. yeah, if everything is stable. I do think that when you talked about taking the angiogram to assess the sinus flow in those instances, that's really important. Sinus flow is critical, yes. I think, yeah. 